No game in the past couple of years had me as hyped as the Resident Evil 4 remake. After playing it, I genuinely think that this should be the blueprint for how remakes should be done. The original game that came out in 2005 is still in my top 5 games of all time, and I don't think that anything will ever push it out of that top 5. There were certain story embellishments and elaborations in this remake though which made certain things make sense, so to speak. So in this video we'll be looking at how the Resident Evil 4 remake expanded on the lore around the game, as well as looking at the expanded backstories of some of the characters in the game. If you want to know the story for the original then I've already made a video on that one, so if you haven't already go and check it out. I have to mention that although the story in this remake has the same overall outcome as in the original, there will be spoilers in this video, so you have been warned. But let's dive in. So as you may know, this story takes place six years after the T-Virus outbreak occurred in Raccoon City, of which the guilty party was a big bad corporation named the Umbrella Corporation. As you also know, Leon S. Kennedy, at the time a rookie cop, was headed to Raccoon City to start his very first shift at the Raccoon Police Department. Leon came across Claire Redfield, also headed to the city to track down her brother Chris, and they soon found the city overrun with flesh-eating hungry zombies. Long story short, Leon, Claire and a young girl named Sherry Birkin escaped an umbrella laboratory underneath Raccoon Police Department, whilst Raccoon City itself was reduced to ashes with a thermobaric missile under the orders of the President of the US, and Raccoon City was cordoned off and kept out of view from the rest of the world. The umbrella then essentially collapsed. Now, here is where our first story difference comes into play. In the original game, Leon started working for the United States government shortly afterwards, a special team called the United States Strategic Command, US STRATCOM for short. This team was under the direct orders of the president. Leon was part of a team that was responsible for preventing the use of bioorganic weapons, amongst other responsibilities, in the remake, however, Leon goes a little further in explaining what exactly happened to him after the raccoon incident. Leon explains that he was asked to join a top secret government program, but it's clear that Leon was essentially forced into the program as he says that he had no choice, likely because of what he knew about the Raccoon City incident and subsequently Raccoon City's sterilization. The US government likely wanted to keep Leon close. So Leon began his training. It was, as he puts it, punishing. Leon trained under Major Jack Krauser, and he says that although the training almost killed him, it helped take his mind off of what happened in Raccoon City. It seems that Leon was, understandably, deeply affected by what happened in 1998. Nonetheless, Leon did manage to complete his training. He then went on a few missions, one of them with Jack Krauser, but we'll get to that a bit later. This explains and I guess ties off the question of how Leon got so proficient in combat and turned from rookie cop into a super badass. When it comes to Luis, his role in the remake is a little different. As we saw in the original, we didn't know him for long as he was killed by Lord Sadler in the castle. This time round, Luis was killed by Krauser. Due to his death being different, Luis got more screen time. Instead of being gagged and locked in a wardrobe, he was bundled into a sack, tied up and thrown underneath the house, leading to Leon finding him and untying him. As he did in the original, he meets with Ada at some point, and this leads to yet another expansion on the storyline. She asks about something called the Amber, but again, that's something we'll be diving into later in the video. In the original, Luis lied to Leon about his background and stated that he used to be a cop in Madrid before he left the force. Luis was saying this to cover up the fact that he had a degree in biology and that he worked for Los Illuminados in their research department. He was the one who discovered the genetic mutations that the Plaga Parasite could achieve. Then we found out that Luis became disillusioned with his work and what Lord Sadler was making him do, so he contacted an organisation, for which Albert Wesker was working for, and agreed to steal a dominant species Plaga for them. Sadler found out and that's why Lewis was detained and why Ada was sent by Wesker to Spain. We did end up learning something about Lewis's childhood in the original, that he was familiar with the area as he used to go hunting in the forest with his grandfather, but the remake expanded on this a little bit more. Luis did still go hunting with his grandfather, but the truth is that Luis actually lived there, in the village. It gets expanded upon further when Leon finds Luis's grandfather's journal which Luis kept on him. His grandfather had high hopes for him, but says that Luis is stuck there in the village. But then we find out that Luis's grandfather died after being attacked by what he called a wolf. His grandfather would then start to deteriorate, hearing voices and notice that his body would start moving on its own. He'd been infected with the plague of parasite. 
The chief of the village at the time, whilst Luis was absent, in an attempt to contain what they considered to be a madness, sets Luis's grandfather's home on fire, and after the death of his grandfather, Luis finally left the village, called Valdalobos, and attained his degree in biology, and then got noticed and started working for Umbrella. More specifically, Umbrella's European Research Division, Laboratory 6. This particular lab was mentioned in the original Resident Evil 3 Nemesis game. Anyway, Luis would start working on and researching a parasitic species called the Nemesis Alpha. Yep, Luis was on the team that had a hand in creating this guy. Nemesis came from implanting a Nemesis Alpha parasite into a T002 clone. This parasite was also responsible for the mutation of Lisa Trevor from Resident Evil 1. However, Luis would soon become disillusioned with his work for Umbrella, and would return to Valdelobos and start working for Los Illuminados. Luis, in the original, was annoyingly vague. He'd start to tell Leon and Ashley something, and then he'd just leave. We know he was kind of working alongside Ada. In the remake, however, Luis is a lot more open. He's clearly showing his guilt. He not only tells them he was implanted with a plague of parasite, but he also shows them proof as well. A scar on his chest showing the successful removal of the parasite from his own body. The remake also goes deeper and shows us that it was the Los Illuminados head researcher Annabelle Escudero who became devoted to Osman Sadler at one point and had all the senior researchers implanted with a plague of parasite which, of course, included Luis himself. This culminated in Luis stealing a dominant species plague of parasite and contacting an organisation, but there's more to the particular plague he stole along with what Sadler intended to do with it and again we'll get to that soon. Now we get on to Chief Mendez, the big cheese. In the original, Chief Mendez was by all accounts exactly as we saw him. A mean, seemingly invincible, absolutely massive angry dude. But in the remake, there's a lot more to him. We now get to understand exactly why he was so furious. It appears that prior to Mendez becoming the village chief, this guy was the chief, and Mendez was in training, I guess. This man appears to have been Chief Mendez's father too, judging from this photograph in Mendez's attic. I'm not sure whether Mendez became the chief due to the passing of his father, but nonetheless, Mendez was entrusted with the village. The village itself was a very traditional village, and a lot of the villagers were themselves devout Catholics. Mendez was very involved in the village, and he kept a record of what happened there. In the remake, we can find three documents which give us a good look into Mendez. It seems that before he became the angry man we see in both games, beneath it all, he was actually a good person. In volume one of Mendez's village records, we can see that he speaks to a young boy who lives in the cabin by the lake with his grandfather. No prizes for guessing who he's talking about. Luis. Mendez details that Luis's mother died in childbirth. Young Luis would even speak to Mendez and tell him stories. It turns out that they knew each other very well. Now this is where the crossover happens. Luis's grandfather gets attacked by the wolf and fears of a madness descends upon the village. Before his grandfather's death, Mendez was told by the grandfather that he knows what to do if anything happens. Luis's grandfather eventually died, and it was actually Chief Mendez who had the cabin set alight, containing the madness, so to speak. Mendez remarked that Luis turned up and didn't say a word. He didn't move a muscle. And then Luis left the village, and this led to him attaining his degree in biology, along with him joining the Umbrella research team. Anyway, with the madness contained somewhat, the villagers would carry on as usual. This tight-knit community would celebrate little successes in making their lives that little bit easier. You see, this was a village that shunned modern technology for a more traditional 18th century lifestyle. A couple of successes under Chief Mendez saw them finding a way to catch more fish, as well as opening up the ironworks which allowed for the creation and manufacture of agricultural tools needed for farming. They built the fish farm, and all was going well in the village under the leadership of Vitoris Mendez who by day was teaching the children of the village literacy and mathematics, and then by the evening he was dining with families in order to hear their grievances. The secluded and very private village was opened up to the outside eventually, and the village was, by all accounts, prospering. But then came along Los Illuminados. Before we continue to look at the downfall of the village of Valdelobos, we'll look at some of the differences the remake uncovered about this strange and deranged parasite-worshipping cult. It seems that the cultists we see in the remake are a lot different than the bumbling mindless drones we see in the original. For a start, they are far more brutal. There are some differences this time round too. The red-robed zealots seem to possess the ability to call upon the Plaga to literally awaken and erupt from its host on request. Now, going back to Chief Mendez's second volume of the village records, we can see here that Mendez wrote about a strange group of black-robed people entering into the village 
and they raised their flag with a spider type insignia on it, preaching about salvation and forgiveness. They then injected the villagers with something, something they claimed that would cure the villagers of madness. Then, as detailed in the third volume of Mendez's village records, we can see that the villagers had completely changed. The farming and the agricultural responsibilities were being neglected, and the cows, not being fed, were growing thin. Less workers meant no crops were being harvested, and villagers started starving. But their loyalty and devotion to their new lord, Osman Sadler, did not wane. By the winter, 30 villagers had died from starvation, so five cows were slaughtered. Lots were cast, and six villagers were chosen for Lord Sadler, and this number only increased over the coming weeks. We see that the cult has been responsible for many disappearances, judging by this room here, which houses a lot of skulls. In the intro sequence, we see that two hikers were captured by the cultists and sacrificed. The police officers reference them at the start of the game, and then Leon comes across these two hikers later in the game. This explains how the villagers in fact became mad, and how Mendez's character shifted more into the realm of the psychotic. Of course, it may have seemed that Los Illuminados came out of nowhere, but in fact they had been operating on a nearby island, where they had not only been researching and adapting an ancient parasitic organism, but had also built up a large militia on said island. At this point, Luis had started working for Los Illuminados, and had helped researchers discover the mutations of the parasite. In the original, it was explained that the plague of parasite was sealed away in a mine underneath the Spanish noble Salazar family's castle for centuries, after the Salazar family fought a long battle against the cult, preventing them from trying to gain control of the parasites. Although this all changed when Lord Osman Sadler came along. Also in the original, we were told from a butler's memo that Salazar, a young impressionable man thought to be around 20 years old, was influenced by Sadler into opening up the mines again, after telling the young nobleman about the sins of his family, and they started excavating, using the villagers as miners. The cult found that the parasites appeared dead, but further examination revealed they were still showing signs of life and were producing spores. However, the damage was done to the miners, who started to show signs of changing after they'd inhaled the spores from parasites. A document by the mining foreman shows us what happened. They of course became ganados, literally translated as cattle. But the overall lore on Los Illuminados' background was expanded quite a bit, so here goes. The biggest question on people's minds was, where on earth did Osman Sadler come from? He literally had no backstory in the original. Well, now we have an answer. Lord Sadler's ancestors went back quite a long way, and they shared the same fervour for Las Plagas. Hester, Keenan, and Adam Sadler were just a few. They wrote the Los Illuminados Bible, if you like, which talked of praising the holy insects, and that they have been promised paradise on earth. They left behind epitaphs, which give us even more backstory on Los Illuminados. According to this epitaph from Adam Sadler, on which the Roman numerals translate to the year 1554, it was here that Adam found his faith, pretty much confirming that this was the start of the cult and the discovery of the Plague of Parasite. Just under 200 years later, in 1741, another Sadler explained how the cult had been expelled from the mainland by the militant wicked. This is obviously talking about the Salazars, and how the mines had been sealed up by the Salazar family, which, in the cult's eyes, was a massive sin. One more thing that we do see in regard to Lord Sadler himself is that one, he's not a cheesy goofball anymore, and two, he seems to be a lot more powerful. In the original, Sadler would seem to only be able to control people that were in his general vicinity, potentially through his staff, and due to him having a dominant species plaga, he could force them to obey him. It's the same case as the original, but now Sadler seems to be able to affect sufferers from a great distance, almost like a hive mind. What's more is that he's able to force Leon to suffer pretty vivid hallucinations. Also, he's got a pretty funky head this time, as well as a few very strange followers that accompany him everywhere. So in my Resident Evil 4 video on the original story, we looked at the origins of Las Plagas. In another video on the story of Resident Evil 0, 1, 2 and 3, we also looked at the origins of Umbrella. In that video, we looked at what Chris and Sheva found in West Africa in Resident Evil 5, a flower containing an RNA virus, which would itself go on to be developed into the progenitor virus, and the progenitor virus would be the basis for the T-virus, which of course led to the outbreak in Raccoon City. Anyway, in Resident Evil 5, it was found that the flowers discovered in West Africa dated all the way back to the Neolithic era, a period of time during the Stone Age. A tribe would consume the flowers and would exhibit superhuman strength and mutant-like abilities. 
wall murals in Resident Evil 5 in an underground city depict the tribe worshipping a purplish organism along with fossilised plaga parasites. It's still not explained how and when these parasites ended up in Spain, but we did find out a little bit more about the plagas now that the remake is out. Also in one of the rooms we can find a drawing on the wall which may depict the same flowers from West Africa. Now speaking of the mines, before, in the original, Leon went through the mines and that was pretty much it. Nothing to scream and shout about, but the remake almost took my breath away when entering into this section here, the insect hive. This tells us so much. Let's revisit what the final chapter of the Illuminados Bible stated about the holy insects. It seems that the insects were very central to the worship exhibited by the cultists. They believed that these insects were holy, that they themselves were capable of infecting victims with the plague of parasite, but the most important discovery was an amber deposit which was sat in a storeroom collecting dust. Luis writes about the fossil inside the amber, and he states that inside this amber was a fossil that contained the same organ that they found inside the dominant species of plaga that was inside Lord Sadler. But the difference is that this particular plaga, when fully developed, may surpass even Lord Sadler's power. This amber would then be the plaga sample that Luis stole from Los Illuminados. As was explained in the original as well, Luis soon realised that Sadler's plan was much more of a political leaning though much more than the apparent worship of bugs and parasitic organisms. He wanted to topple the US government from within, and he found the perfect tool to aid him in that mission. In the original game, Leon meets Krauser, and they have a knife fight on the island. Krauser explains that Leon probably heard that he died in the crash two years prior, in 2002. Obviously not the case. Krauser also explains during the fight that he wants the sample that Sadler developed, and that he needed Ashley in order to buy Sadler's trust in him. It's clear that Leon and Krauser knew each other, but in the original we didn't really know how, until 2009's Dark Side Chronicles. Some of you familiar with Resident Evil lore will recall that in Dark Side Chronicles, Leon is sent by the US government to search for a drug lord in South America called Javier Hidalgo, who has been working alongside Umbrella in the sale of BOWs. Major Krauser went with Leon, but he was jealous of Leon's mission coming directly from the US president himself. Krauser grew even more resentful of Leon as time went on, and Krauser didn't even believe in the existence of BOWs at all. That is until Krauser went on to get wounded by Hidalgo's BOW mutated wife Hilda, which essentially put an end to his ambitions in regard to his career. Anyway, it's revealed that Hidalgo strengthened himself with the use of BOWs, and Krauser not only understood why Hidalgo did this, but he also sympathised with him too. In Krauser's own words, the darkness awoke deep inside him. Krauser then reached out to Wesker, who was working for a mysterious organisation, and Krauser was sent to Spain to infiltrate Los Illuminados and retrieve a dominant plaga sample. He soon learned of Sadler's aim to infiltrate the US government through the plagas. In an attempt to gain Sadler's trust, Krauser kidnapped Ashley Graham while she was travelling home from university, despite her having a guard detail, what with her being the president's daughter and all. In the original, that's pretty much all we're told about the abduction and Krauser's connection to Leon, and we were left to work a rest out. But as with the theme of this video, the remake expands further. We've discussed that Krauser trained Leon, and that Leon got sent on missions, although the intro to the game doesn't say what missions exactly. In the remake, a case file reveals that Operation Javier went a little bit differently, and it's potentially confused things. According to the case file, Operation Javier was top secret. So top secret that not even high ranks of the US government were aware of it. Knowledge of this operation was quite simply buried due to the inhumanity surrounding it. But the remake tells us this about Operation Javier. Essentially, a small unit of elite special forces soldiers were sent to eradicate the drug cartels in South America. In the case file, it's revealed that the entire unit was wiped out, but for one soldier, Jack Krauser. But it gets worse. The unit wasn't wiped out by the cartels, but instead by their own government. Signs pointed to a potential power struggle within the US government, which led them not to extract the unit, and after the deaths of the soldiers, the government basically covered everything up. Jack Krauser was therefore considered dead. A note on the case file left by Krauser indicates that the document in question was written by an American journalist, and judging by the second note, the journalist has been taken care of, and the document seized by Krauser. There's not really any mention of Leon going with Krauser on Operation Javier though, and this could be because Leon was a government agent, and technically, he was never there. When it came to Ashley's abduction, we already knew that Krauser wasn't working alone. This was meticulously planned abduction from within Ashley Graham's security detail. 
the Secret Service. What we did learn was that Ashley would be transferred onto a cargo ship and then transported and delivered to Los Illuminados in Spain. This gave us a wider look into exactly why Leon was the only one in contention for this mission. He was the only one that was clear of any wrongdoing inside the president's staff, as everyone else was under investigation. So yeah, we learned a bit more about Krauser, but the Operation Javier thing kind of threw a spanner in the works. Krauser, in the original at least, seemed to be desperate to gain Sadler's trust. His hatred for the US government caused him to completely defect to Los Illuminados, and given that Krauser wants strength and power, he figures that the dominant species Plaga can give him that. His failure to retrieve a sample of the virus for the mysterious organization and Wesker prompted Ada to be sent to Spain to retrieve it herself. Krauser and Ada would speak at points in the original, but none of these interactions took place in the remake. Krauser also had a minor change to his role in the remake, as he was the one who collected Ashley from Ramon Salazar and took her to the island, as opposed to some of Salazar's men taking her there in the original. Speaking of Salazar, let's look at him next. Let's take a look at what changes we've seen when it comes to the 8th Castellan, Ramon Salazar. In the original, it seemed, at least from the butler's notes, that poor Ramon was just a young man who simply got influenced by Osman Sadler and guilt-tripped into redeeming himself for the sins of his family. We may have thought, was Ramon always this depraved? Well, in the remake, we get a little more of a glimpse into what Ramon was actually like. A note by the housekeeper states that they have failed. And this seems to indicate that Ramon's father, Diego, the seventh Castellan, before he passed on, was concerned about his son and his rather unstable mind, so entrusted the housekeeper to keep Ramon from the path of wickedness. The housekeeper goes on to state that during Ramon's younger years, a servant uttered Polgacito behind his back, which essentially means that they were making fun of his height. He then doused the servants with some vitriol, which is essentially sulfuric acid. He then watched in glee as the servant writhed around in agony on the floor. The housekeeper still blamed the cult for influencing Ramon into removing the seal, keeping Las Plagas locked away. Another cool change and expansion to the law is an explanation as to what on earth the two servants he has to his left and right are. In the original game, we see these two, Leon fights one and the other gets assimilated into Ramon's monstrous mutated form. However, documents in the remake give us more insight. To start with, you may have noticed a new addition to the water hall within the castle, a volatile black liquid erupting from the pools, which wasn't present in the original game. It seems that this strange black liquid, no, it's nothing to do with the mold in Resident Evil 7 and 8, acts as a stimulant for the plug which speeds up, or rather at least guarantees that the parasite can assimilate successfully with the host. We also see this liquid being force-fed to Ashley in the castle throne room. One of Ramon's servants, a man named Esidro Uriate Talavera, was tasked by Ramon to improve the flaws of the human form, to seek perfection as observed in arthropods, which are essentially creatures which are invertebrates, i.e. no skeleton or backbone, and instead have a hard exoskeleton. Two years later, Isidro found a way to transfuse this black liquid into the body. Some prisoners thrown into a cave underneath the castle were thirsty and drank the liquid, leading to complete madness. But another two years later, and success, Isidro discovered a new species and named it U2, a sacred lava which would be carried and developed in the wombs of the Chosen. This species was named the Novistador, and they are the annoying flying insects. Another two years later, Isidro fused together human and insect. The housekeeper volunteered herself for this experiment. And one year later, out was born one of the two bodyguards of Ramon. Isidro named this one Pesanta, but then he decided two is better than one. The other would come as a result of Isidro volunteering himself for the same experiment to prove his loyalty to his master, and he became the other bodyguard, Verdugo. These two would be known as the Verdugos, which is literally translated as Executioner. It was great that Capcom expanded upon these two creatures and where they came from. And finally, one of the creepiest, most tense encounters in the original was Blind Wolverine in the prison, something called the Garador. We encounter him again in the remake, but this time in a much creepier setting, in the darkness of the castle dungeons. A note in the remake tells us more about this individual. According to the castle caretaker, he used to be the Salazar's torturer. It was a generational thing. His father and grandfather served as that before him in the very same capacity. The caretaker states that he harbors enough hate inside him to ruin the world. He was allegedly gifted at tormenting others. It's not clear exactly why Ramon Salazar had the man locked away and blinded in the dungeon, but unfortunately it fell upon the caretaker to feed and care for him. The caretaker then, driven mad by the screams coming from the man, 
simply left the castle. It's a small little bit of lore, but it was awesome to find out a bit more about him. Okay, so in the original, we see that Ada was sent to Spain in order to retrieve the sample that Krauser failed to get. She was also ordered by Wesker to kill Leon if he becomes a threat to their goals. Ada's side of the events in Valdelobos was seen through the expansion called Separate Ways. This campaign wasn't included in the remake, but in a small teaser of what may be to come, Leon says this. I think we both know this. It's where we go our separate ways. Anyway, at the end of the original game, when Ada boards a chopper and leaves the island with the sample, she has two. She swaps the dominant species sample with a subservient one. She delivers the subservient one to Wesker, forcing him to go to the island and retrieve a dominant sample from the corpse of Jack Krauser. In the remake, however, Ada has a little chat with Wesker and asks him what he plans to do with the sample. Here's how that conversation goes. I've obtained the amber. Excellent. Just one question. What are you planning to do with this? We do not pay you to ask questions. All you need to know is a new dawn is breaking. A hundred will give their lives so that just one may live. I am expediting that change. So, we're talking millions of casualties. Billions. How ambitious. Did you notice anything on the screens? Excella Gione of Tricell and the Stairway to the Sun Flowers in West Africa. This game obviously leads into Resident Evil 5 and the creation of the Ouroboros project. I have a video on Resident Evil 5's story if you want to check that out too. So basically Ada finds out that Wesker is going against their employers. So after their conversation, Ada holds the chopper pilot hostage and instead diverts the chopper to somewhere else. Given that Wesker was planning to betray the mysterious organization he and Ada were working for, it's likely that Ada informed her employers about Wesker's deception, leading to him being ousted from the organization and working alongside Excella and Ricardo Irving in Africa. Finally, as a little bonus, we'll look at some cool, minor changes shown in the game, which make no difference to the storyline. The first one is at the start, where the officer takes a leak, in line with the original, but this time, the officer gets drawn into the forest to investigate a noise, leading to both the police officer's inevitable demise at the hands of the villagers and Del Lago. And as we see in the original, the police officers instead get taken off screen after their car is rammed off a cliff. The developers played a mean trick in making you think that the dog or wolf from the start of the original game was killed, but then they surprise you later on and let you save the dog. Also this time around you couldn't camp in the bell tower like you could in the original, the floor literally gave way this time, forcing you to face Dr. Salvador. Another cool difference was the completely unexpected blowing up of the bell tower. The removal of the gondola section in the original meant that Mendez's eyeball wasn't needed as a key item, so it could simply be sold for cash to the merchant. The original troll encounter with the chain doors was removed in favour of a narrow area with regular enemies instead. The Del Lago section was much more explorable this time round with various side areas, and the Ashley section was much more enjoyable too. Gone was that horrific sliding puzzle which instead got replaced with something a lot less rage inducing. As well as that, the section with El Gigante, instead of him just bursting into the area, we find out that he was actually dormant, but the plague inside him was awoken by a red-robed zealot. Another thing which I thought was an awesome touch was the parasites attaching themselves to the cultists and literally controlling them like puppets. Also, when you killed a Ganado or a cultist, you could literally see their insides moving. It's pretty grim. They replaced the originals running away from the Salazar statue section and incorporated it into this section from the original, by adding the statue as a fire hazard. My absolute favourite reworked section of the remake though was the minecart section. There was just something super hilarious about seeing Dr Salvador holding a chainsaw and staring at you whilst riding a minecart next to you. Unfortunately this section led to the death of Luis by Jack Krauser this time, instead of his original demise at the freaky tentacle belonging to Sadler, although I am grateful he got extra screen time in the remake. Speaking of Krauser, the knife fight was awesome this time, instead of a QTE sequence we got an actual fight, and before Lewis actually dies, he is the one who saves Leon from being killed by Krauser, instead of Ada in the original. 
The Ashley section where she was driving the forklift was gone, thank the lord, and it was replaced by a wrecking ball section where Leon had to protect the forklift and Ashley from lots of enemies. And then there was the minor difference where Ashley was taken in the original by the Novistador, whereas in the remake she was taken by one of the Verdugos. But finally, what was missing was the totally crazy laser hallway section, along with the boss fight in the canyon. Some people are hoping that it'll be coming in a DLC of separate ways. Who knows? We'll see. But anyway, that's it for this video. I hope this did a good job of explaining what the remake expanded on in terms of the lore surrounding what is, and will always be one of my all-time favourite games. If you enjoyed this video, then please leave a like on it and subscribe if you aren't already. But for now, take care, and I will see you in the next one.